Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fall 2020 Woolsack and Wynn Poetry Launch. And we are very happy to have all of you here with us tonight as we are launching four fantastic collections of poetry. And, uh, uh, and here we are uh, on the Zoom platform coming to you live, uh, not just from Hamilton, but from Hamilton, from Toronto, from all over. And we have uh, uh, attendees in the waiting room here uh, from uh, as far away as Athens, Georgia, and Raleigh, and uh, all points in between, and from across Canada. And it's really great to see you all here. Um, uh, what, uh, what this forum lacks in uh, sort of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, contact uh, makes up for in the global village. And we're very pleased to see an audience here from, from far and wide. So welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Paul Vermeersch and I'm the senior editor of Woolsack and Wynn. And um, I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce to you uh, to uh, to begin our our, uh, our launch tonight, the publisher of Woolsack and Win, Noel Allen. Uh, so take it away, Noel. You uh, you're ready to go. Thank you so much, Paul. And it's it's great to see everybody. Normally, I would say something like, "It's wonderful that you came out on such a beautiful evening," but it's actually pouring rain, and we're all inside, so that's okay. Um, it's great to be celebrating tonight, and I'm just going to open this up with a few little bits and pieces that we should do. Um, the first is um, a land acknowledgement we'd like to start with. And it might seem strange to do a land acknowledgement when we're holding a virtual event, but Woolsack Wynn is lucky enough to exist in a city filled with people who love the arts, and, and we should recognize where we are. And we must always remember that the city and country we live in is built on broken promises and land theft. And it's particularly important to remember this on Orange Shirt Day, which is today, September 30th, our launch, um, which is a time dedicated to remembering the atrocities of our residential school system. Um, and if we don't take this time to remember and acknowledge our history, we can't begin to address the wrongs that have been done. So just quickly here, the city of Hamilton is situated on the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee and Mississaugas, this is land which is covered by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is with an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase of 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, the city of Hamilton is home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we recognize that we must do more about the, to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our role as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. Um, and I'd also like to take a short moment to thank our funding agencies. We had them up on our screen, but really without organizations like the Ontario Arts Council, Ontario Creates, the Department of Canadian Heritage, and the Canada Council, we would simply not be able to bring up the wonderful books of poetry like the poetry collections that we are here to launch this evening. Um, and let's celebrate the poets. I'm not gonna talk long, publishers are boring. Our main job is to write those grant applications to those wonderful agencies and to say, and to take care of all the paperwork. So our first poet up this evening is Ross Below, who will be reading from his new release, Moving to Climate Change Hours. Uh, now, when Ross first brought me this collection, I opened up the manuscript to a poem about the TH and B railway, which is a storied railway in Hamilton. And then I found one about working at an oil refinery, and I was hooked. I don't often get poetry submitted to the press that is grounded in the lives of the people who work in heavy industry, even though we're surrounded by heavy industry here in Hamilton. Um, and Ross has grounded his collection in just those lives, and he's done it brilliantly. Uh, these are poems that look carefully at the cost of our oil-enabled lifestyles, and these are high costs. High costs for the people who work in the industries, and high costs for all of us, whether, they're, uh, whether the cost is climate change or a disaster like Lake Mac Lac Megantic. But these poems are not all that dark. Um, there's elegant nature poems in here and some wonderful reflections and humor, but I'm going to stop talking, just tell you a little bit more about Ross, and then turn this over to him. So Ross Below is a poet, photographer, documentary filmmaker, and an energy and climate change columnist. He previously worked for a major 
Canadian Petroleum Company for decades before retiring 2014. And now he writes eco-poetics and opinion pieces about government climate change in action. Ross was a finalist for the CPC Poetry Prize in 2016 and longlisted in 2018. And in 2017, he completed an MFA at St. Mary's College of California. So Ross, can I hand this over to you? Sure. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome all the people that are attending. It's really quite wonderful. Um, and I see a technical glitch already. My microphone's making noise, right? Is that true, Noel? Um, geez. Okay. I do hear a bit of a hum there, Ross. Yeah, let me try a different mic. Oh. <laughs> All right. Let's see if this works. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so welcome to everybody, people local, uh, friends and family from around here, and then people from far away. All right, we'll just change microphones. Um, hopefully this works. Um, I'll talk a little louder. Uh, people from far away. So uh, we did hear some people. I've got uh, uh, people I know from the West Coast and uh, Chicago, I see, as well as uh, Ohio, I think, and um, an old flatmate of mine from California who's uh, in Bedford, England, um, is attending. So. I mean, it's pretty fantastic. So um, the online format gives people access that normally wouldn't, which is uh, pretty wonderful. Uh, I'd like to thank Noelle for offering to publish this book and her enthusiasm and for bringing out all these books in the middle of a pandemic. Um, it takes a certain kind of bravery. And her team for producing such a beautiful object to contain my poetry. Ashley for her diligence and patience for shaping the text for publication. Jared for his outstanding design, Carmine for his insights and suggestions. I also have many people to thank. Um, this book took over 12 years to write, and I leaned on and learned from many people. Um, they're listed in the book and the acknowledgements. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of them right now. Uh, I do wanna center out uh, Brenda Hillman and Matthew Zapruder uh, from my time at St. Mary's. Uh, for the knowledge, passion, and openness to poetry um, that they gave me, uh, the poetics that are in this book. I have a, a large uh, part, a large part of the poet poetics in the book have to do with them. I uh, also like to thank my kids, Heather, Neil, Allison, Aaron, my grandkids, Owen, Chloe, and Carson, and a special uh, person, Sarah, who's been on this poetic adventure with me, uh, and she will appear in a poem shortly. So I'm going to read four poems. Uh, what are they about? Um, from the back of the book, Matthew Zapruder says about the poet, which is me. Uh, uh, the poet's confronting life in middle age, as well as his own complicity and larger catastrophes. So I'm hoping this reading gives you a flavor of what Matthew's talking about. The first poem I'm going to read is the first poem in the book. First day, Gulf Oil Refinery, Clarkson, Ontario, 1979. Two men blinded by hydrofluoric acid yesterday. The skin of one absorbed acid and it ate his bones. He died this morning. The gate safety sign says 12 hours work since the last lost time. The safety trainer lectures, hydrogen sulfide. At high concentrations, it causes olfactory paralysis. You can't smell it. Then you fall down unconscious, and next you die. If you see a body on the ground, you must check wind direction, move up wind, call for help. Imagine your best friend Bill on the ground, how it would feel to leave him. This is your first day. Wear work boots, learn work rules, get the paycheck, go home to Shelly, pregnant with Neil, looking after little Heather. Do the right thing, be a good boy, come home safe 10,000 more times. OK. 
Okay, the second poem is uh, the one I just promised you where Sarah appears. Um, it's made of, it occurs in two locations, um, Eugene, Oregon, as well as Banff, uh, Alberta. At a slough in Eugene. Sarah and I stand above Amazon Creek's oil slow waters. Herbly evening shadows side by each companion's motioning. Reflected voices all blurred blood rushing towards blood silence and erasure. I understand nothing. Memories, longing, purposelessness. There once was a woman cliff edge at Bow Falls, wondering how I got there. Rapids far below a story I hadn't ever heard. I didn't enjoy heights. Her sure-footedness convinced me a magpie once walked through her body and saved her. My foot slipped as twilight entered my body. I accept safety as desire only when there is nothing left and everything is in relationship to failing. Each day brings its own light which cannot be owned. She may have felt that way too. But in that, it is all like yesterday, cold stone, unclimbed mountains, where language fails completely. Blueness all up under this chanting. The third poem has a very long title. Black and white image of frozen beach. Lake Erie ice stretched out to open water's thin blade, sun high, reflection of sun, a shining path across a water horizon, across buckled ice, across sand blended with hard snow, blended with sand. I think she died that day, or maybe not until the next. On the way to the hospital, I stopped and took the photo. The ice, the water, sky, in real life, not black and white, but all Prussian blue, and set with an overly brilliant sun. I'm not saying it felt like death exactly, more like the moment before or the moment after. And I remember thinking of a sparrow song, rapid and thin. There was no sparrow. Beach and sky devoid of life, except for the occasional explosive cracks of ice as it shoved itself ashore. And the last poem, well, actually mentioned this place in her introduction, um, Lock Megantique. Um, most Canadians know that some of the uh, people on this um, Zoom meeting may not realize Lac Megantic was a scene of a um, crude rail derailment in the middle of the night in a small town where it took out half the downtown. Lac Megantic. Observe slim moon, usual July stars, clean night breeze. They put railway tracks right down the middle of this small town street as if inviting the multitude to descend. A bar in the center of town called Musée Café. A band takes a break around them, a guitarist outside smoking, a couple at a table on the patio. They are 40-ish and met here tonight by accident. A friend leaves at 1 a.m. for her car, winks at them. Rotting fruit smell of oil. What emerges from feeding our addiction. 20 million pounds of steel and Bakken crude oil on fire. 47 people killed. Five of them vaporized. The local hospital said no injuries got treated. They were all dead already. The young firefighter pulled his ex-girlfriend from wreckage committed suicide three and a half months later. Receive back your names. Enumerate your ages. You, how you left Musée Café, left your friend, your brothers, how you were singing. You, 
Tell us how you prayed every matin at 4 a.m. Your benedictions asked for, received. You, your little sister slept under the sky's black curve. Your souls to keep. Stars once reflecting, waters once unoiled, lake of places where the fishes are held. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Uh, if we were in a live venue, this would be the moment where I would ask the, the audience to uh, offer a round of applause to Ross Bellot, and uh, and yet we cannot do that. And I noticed that many of you are using the chat window here in Zoom to uh, let Ross and our poets know what you think of their readings. So uh, I encourage you to do that. If you want to make sure that your comment is public, uh, choose to all panel panelists and attendees, uh, and you can I think select other options from the uh, drop down menu if you want to send a more direct message. But yeah, please use the, the chat feature here and, um, and we'll let our, our authors know what you're thinking of their readings tonight. Uh, and speaking of which, that will take me to uh, the introduction of our next poet. And it pleases me greatly to introduce Lauren Turner. And before I turn the, the uh, the floor over to Lauren, I, I want to tell a little story about the uh, the acquisition of her book and how it came to Wilsack and Wynn, because I, I think that Lauren's uh, book might have set a, a speed record between uh, a book landing on my desk and it, and it, and it landing on our list. And uh, I, read, uh, uh, I read the book, I came into the office for a meeting and, uh, and, uh, and someone handed me Lauren's manuscript and said, what do you think of this one? And I sat down and I started reading it and I didn't look up until I had finished reading the whole thing. I, I read it in one sitting, I read it again. And then I said, I think we gotta do this one. And we got Lauren on the phone and we said, we'd like to do your book and the rest was history. Uh, and I think all of that uh, happened in one sitting and, um, and it's, a, it's a fond memory that I have. Uh, and it's one of those experiences working in book publishing where the stars align and everything happens just perfectly. And, uh, and it was from there that Lauren and I began working on this beautiful book, The Only Card in a Deck of Knives, which if you visit woolsackandwin.ca, uh, is now uh, being offered at a discounted price and we urge you to take advantage of the special offers that we have. And there you go, uh, our, our intern Brianna Wodebeck just posted the, uh, the information and the link to uh, our web store. So uh, if you're already a fan of Lauren's work and I know many of you are, uh, you may already have a copy, but if you haven't got one yet, now's your chance. And if you're discovering Lauren's work for the first time, uh, then uh, I cannot direct you to the book table at the back of the room, and, and this is the next best thing. Uh, visit our web store and take advantage of our special offer tonight. The only card in a deck of knives is a harrowing book, beautifully written. And uh, like, like many books of poetry, it chronicles one's lived experience uh, in a way that elevates it. And... Um, uh, Lauren has worked so hard to make this book as beautiful and as thoughtful and as harrowing at times as it is. And I want to leave uh, a little bit of time for Lauren to describe the book uh, from her point of view, because it's a very personal book. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with Lauren on this book, and I hope that uh, it will resonate with you as well. Please welcome to uh, our launch, Lauren Turner. Thank you, Paul. It was such a lovely introduction. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Noel and Paul and everyone who I worked with at Will Second Win for making all of my poetry dreams come true. I'm so glad that slush piles actually get read. I was told that like, unless you had like personal connections, it's very, very unlikely to get a book published. I was just like, well, <laughs> I just love what you published. So I decided to send anyways and see what happened. I'm so glad it worked out this way. Um, so uh, my book, I guess, to put it as concisely as possible, is mostly about bad men and illness. And we've had like way too much of both in 2020. So 
I decided after the presidential debates last night to leave the bad man poems out entirely and just read the poems, or oh, four poems about being sick. Um, I guess just to, I don't really want to go into all the medical stuff and bore you with that, but to um, sum it up, I have a cystic lung disease. So the book mostly just centers on the diagnosis process for that and just like the before and the after of the, that kind of fallout. So the first poem I'm going to read is called Choose Your Own. I met a man at the tip of my tongue. He didn't care for what I was saying or he found my forever intriguing for a time measured in the mechanics of streetlights. Nocturne tumbled from my hands like unkissed dice, or evening took forever to settle the windows into mirrors. I revealed the tumors puncturing my breath, or I told carefully minted stories, my magnificent lies. Life is everyone's fool, I flirted, or I asked, I'm dying, is that interesting to you? The bar built worlds on wages, patrons a liquid lineup of postures and hues, chemicals and rainwater. Or I was puritanically sober, my hollowed out eyes blinking above an oxygen mask. The man was a shot I threw over my shoulder, or the man was shot through by my tenderness because I cultivate every softness for my knives to pierce later on. His many hopeful balloons began hampering me with the responsibility of their care, or I gave willingly my psyche's launch codes while crying out, why, why, why the hell not? Immortal with self-destruction, I was the best woman for non-committal pledges, made salient by liquor and unlikely fruition, or strangers meant every word, cradling my wrists in gold nooses like lambs led away. Shadows were billowing across doubt's nooks, but when that man stood me to dance, I did. I'm cheating, I have a set list so I can actually find my poems. <laughs> okay, the next one is called between two lobes, I was released. I cannot say the unimaginable thing in this dress meant only for Fridays. I have said my brain was fine in that tone that frightened the other children. There was a garden we couldn't speak of anymore. My dearest neurons, a gorilla squad firing, sorry, a gorilla firing squad voguing to pose me on my knees in the lavender. I plead. The maze was harmless topiary. It was, in fact, a grove of shrubs with pierced fruit we couldn't look at twice. Can I take a long stroll before the sentence no longer makes sense? Of course, buried treasure must reside in the deepest hole we can conceive. Of course, my cortex hid two gilded tumors in the folds of its sleeves. I am sick of saying sickness is uncalculated when it pops off my flower heads without missing a single bud. Who will come visiting when I call agape for arrows and silence as the name of comrades? Like aspirations, a solitary seizure takes on many forms, a drawn stare, a string of mix-ups, the drop into Psyche's coup. I am told I looked at the minotaur with every intent of purpose. I am told I blinked and fell toward the garden with fists aloft. It was high pressure tonight too, because both of my parents, I think this is the first time my dad has ever heard me read. So I had to also pick parent appropriate poems and I don't think that my book really is. So. <laughs> This one's called The Spell Shattered Long Before. A rock's glass shatters when he knives my confession to how I afford the oxygen for an entire body turned lung. Record the scene as myself, 
having the agency to break that glass instead of myself. Don't see me as gone oblong, a black curtain with hands and red lips at his seat's pew, kneading it. Listen, my mother prepared her children basil sandwiches, debates which our hearts wilting into cannibals. My core matter is indelicate, black thighs clipped to rickety bar stools. I flaunt unmentionables with daddies who can't be taught to appreciate the best trick. How I soften my organs into gym, gin gimlets and tumors. Refuse my magic if you want to protest. A fate field act doesn't count. Only egg cracks the enigma of genetics. As a girl child, mom buried my monogram barrettes. She knew I'd trail anyone home who held the lock key of my name. I answer the cosmos as five foot ten bones to pick still somehow performing my charade of health, hightailing the dingy days that pillage every crevice. Why do I let fools talk to me of dying? Please turn away when I confide in him. Ghosts are visiting my childhood garden to exhume my barrettes. Watch them take my name in vain like a plea or an absolution. It's all the same to me. I'm going to read one more. I think anyone who's been a chronically ill woman in any medical system knows the importance of having like a really good, compassionate doctor. Um, and I'm lucky enough that my mess for all just is that kind of doctor for me. So and just one of the things that she said to me that really stood out when I was going through the whole process of being diagnosed with um, uh, like a respiratory illness and just the consequences of what it would mean to like have like an illness that is over time terminal. Uh, she said to me um, just to like try to like keep things level and keep things calm and she said we don't want to make you sicker than you are so I just wrote that this poem based on that. In this business of caring she says we don't want to make you sicker than you are body scanned and nude under ultraviolet. Paint me with luminal to reveal where the crime occurred. I am a child's ceiling of glow in the dark stars and that's fine until I want my own child to sleep under it. Each appointment, she takes my hands in her hands like hooves. My grandmother couldn't find a foal in the Winnipeg toy shops. So she gave me a donkey and I learned to prefer donkeys. Children are simple in ways. I remember my mother fainting in every garden on our walk home from the fairgrounds, and it was fine. I waited, crouched gnome-like, imagining my pinafore tent. She says, every tumid organ is still playing along. My body, carrying an embryo under water, would drown me inside to lift its cargo toward Earth. I am waving off the babe in my husband's arms, and that's fine, unless we want our own child to sleep there. Each appointment, she hangs a mobile above my grief. My grandmother couldn't buy the time to call after the news, so she gave me silence, and I learned to prefer silence. Adults are simple in ways. I remember a mother letting her baby chew my coat buttons in the cafe, how I was fine and kept my tears for later. I waited, smiled hurt-like, imagining my future a swaddle. She says, caring won't always feel this way and I know it, didn't I always know? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Lauren. Thank you very much. And once again, let's use the uh, chat window so to uh, show our appreciation for Lauren's poetry and, um, and uh, let's show our appreciation once more by visiting the woolsackandwind.ca uh, web store. And there's the link uh, in the chat window once again uh, to, uh, to buy a book, buy all the books and uh, you'll save uh, $22 overall. The information is in the chat window and it will appear again. And that was Lauren Turner reading from the only card in a deck of knives.
Uh, and we'll turn our attention to James Lindsay. Uh, and the story behind this book is very different from the story behind Lauren Turner's book. James Lindsay's book did not take me by surprise. This book is the second book that we've published by James here at the press. I should also point out that this James Lindsay is not the James Lindsay uh, who is the author of uh, uh, cynical uh, right-wing screeds. This is, a di this is the good James Lindsay. This is a different James Lindsay. This, is th this James Lindsay is talented and brilliant and adorable and, um, and we don't want him being mistaken for the other James Lindsay. Uh, James and I have known each other for a long time, and I've been an admirer of his poetry for a real long time. Uh, Twelve years ago or more, we worked together in a bookstore in downtown Toronto called Book City. And it was one day while we were working at the store, James asked me if I'd look at a couple of his poems, and, and we, uh, we agreed to meet at a local uh, establishment that served beverages. And... Um, and that was sort of the beginning of our working together uh, in, in poetic terms. And we've been sharing our poetry back and forth ever since. Uh, the first book that James did with us at Woolsack and Wynn is Our Inland Sea. It came out a few years back and we we're very happy uh, that, that he brought that book to us. And then now the follow-up is Double Self Portrait. And that double uh, means a lot of things. It means the second book. And, uh, and uh, James can certainly fill you in on, on what else it means. Um, but let's talk about the self-portrait. Uh, a lot of people, when they hear self-portrait, they think of art that's very inward looking, that looks back at the self. But in fact, we'll find that in, in, in this particular book by James Lindsay, it's very much uh, uh, an outward looking book. Uh, one of the central themes of this book is ekphrasis, which is poetry about artworks created by others. So it's in these poems that James is looking out at art created by other people and engaging with it in creative and, 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 and enlivening ways. Uh, and the poetry is, uh, is uh, masterful. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to work with James and an honor to publish him. Uh, and I will turn him over to you now. Welcome, James. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I think it was actually 15 years we met ago. I was thinking about that the other day because I've been married for less time than we've known each other. Um, I have some things to say about this book as well, but I'm just going to jump right in for now. It's called Ooze and Woos. Where the protruding barn nail tore my elderly feather hemorrhaging coat, a hundred thousand threads were born again and aroused the windows. Trembling, not from the nervousness of meeting us, but the choppy lake gusts. Water guts guffawing at winter storm hilarities, which were, to be fair, pretty funny. But not in the way we would laugh at in front of our owners. Unlike electric heaters exposed orange coils, begging to be diddled, and you grew irritable from snatching my hand by the wrist, and no one slept with all the winds asthmatic choir frisking the exterior, patting down the heritage cottage nonchalantly, the casual touching suggesting it knew nothing was hidden inside. Confidence I wish we shared when the oohs and woos grew in intensity as afternoon lurched along like ice, slowly exploding from glaciers, or the lake's glass eczema, whispering as it meets itself all over, again and again and again. I can see a lot of friends showing up tonight, so I just want to say thank you very much to everyone um, who came. Thank you so much to Paul again. He's been a friend and a mentor, and I really wouldn't have gotten this far without you, uh, and to Noel and everyone at Woolsack. Um, speaking of doubling, this, this next poem is about my son, Eli, uh, and I wrote it just when he was a few weeks old, and it's very much about being a new parent, and he plays a lot in it as, as sort of a, a child as a form of doubling as well. This is called Failed Interview Questions. It's for Eli. How loud was it in utero 
in the midst of an inside's white noise roaring away like a river or the engine that powers a cicada's whirring purr as it sheds an exoskeleton it wore as somewhere expressions comfortably year in year out until a sketch artist depicts it and upon seeing a hyperbole of their own face rids it from their repertoire is the silence you hear now that the drone of mom's body keeping you alive is gone the reason why you cry with such gusto and confidence in the electric mechanism that makes the bees buzz recognizable comfortable to those of us who grew up unallergic and knowing that colonies the keepers spoke of were hives vibrating with visible static electricity do you realize how useless i am to you that i cannot keep you alive alone i am need as much as you but you are narcissism without center and I am anxiety measured by the way I judge my double self portrait. And don't think that means you. Lookalikes live in the internal, that artificial visual of you existed before you existed. Mind made bait designed to lure you to me. Who are you reaching for when you suddenly wake, arms outstretched and panic in your eyes, startled to still be here? then immediately lose consciousness, baffling the hushed tones we speak as you dream feed in near dark with busy fingers improvising on an instrument only you can play, self-soothing to a melody only you can hear, learning to dream by braille. Are your murmuring coos responses to my attempts at conversation with you, something unknowable only for me, unintentional code whose meaning lives in my tries a translation my fidgeting with a cipher you squirm on the play mat or are you playing at how to enjoy a fussy tet a tet an auto interview intimacy that must fail in order to be near real why can't i complete a question for you and is it unfair to ask anything of you, even if what I want is a face I can believe was made for me, and not because you are discovering internal movement, engines and electric mechanisms grinding against your brain, and inspiring contortions I interpret as dance, depicting the frustration of experience, when time is only the present, memory something yet to be learned, then overlooked, but that is impossible for me. My lack of hormones is a split link, makes me a citizen tourist in an aimless authoritarian country whose rules I abide adoringly. For I choose to live like this, in love with my tiny benevolent sovereign, awakening to his reign. Decorative Knots. Plain spoken decorative knots, painstakingly tied glass tubes, undenominational insofar as it's not worth distinguishing individuals from the overall effect, but important enough to stand back, let the stressed eyes relax, deaf perception blur permanently, become one unconcerned by sight, plucky enough to feel out the passage by guy wire, counting twists as the alley narrows and allies fall behind. Then the likeness will step forward, drop robe, give a little twirl, begging for honest opinions. Honest opinions unfiltered by social niceties or personal curation. A selection of sub-organisms mounted on a whiteboard and organized by color, shape, and texture. So those who can't stomach seeing a dead thing can still tell what they're touching. As Paul mentioned, um, there's a lot of Ekphrasis poems in this work. Thank you everyone for the nice comments, by the way. Thank you. Um, and I'll, I'm going to read a couple. The way they're laid out, which was originally a chapbook called Ekphrasis, Ekphrasis on Anstrom Press, is they sort of 
complement each other. I know that looks weird. You'll have to pick up the book to see it, but they act as siblings. There's a pair of poems on either page on the recto and verso. And I was a big pain in the butt for Woolsack and Wynn in this. So I'd like to give another thank you for, for them for putting so much work into it. So I'm gonna read two of the sibling poems. This first one is called Matana Roberts Plays No Title by Eva Hess of the Whitney. And these are based off videos that you can find on the Whitney's website where they invited musicians to come in and improvise uh, to paintings there. So this is a, uh, just an incredible saxophone player called Matana Roberts and she's playing uh, to a sculpture uh, with no title by Eva Hess. A flesh-like lattice suspended from the ceiling orbited by bunched black taffeta and senopath saxophone by way of the meanderer's swerve that takes the shape of a heart-rending tendril. Exqui unbound bindings, the flayed original intent, a final piece uninstalled during her lifetime. Exquisite innards, a malleable solo, afraid anti-heroic, confronting manufactured solids in a string sieve, barely snaring latex dipped bop. In a garb of rope that alludes to pollock drips, a goo of ghost notes confidently saunters through a web net never meant to snare. And this is its sibling poem. Um, it's called Lauren Connors plays Four Darks and Red by Mark Rothko at the Whitney. Lauren Connors is just a, a brilliant uh, improvisational American guitar player. He's very quiet, very beautiful. And he has, I should say, he has Parkinson's, which plays into this. Oxygen makes blood bright, and the effects pedal makes the electric strings hum and haw. When dry, it's rust and clunky chords. Chuching cherry petals boiled down to ghost notes, longer than taller. Wrong squares on the wall of the echo chamber. A quiet slide down nondescript umberish strip that seems to be holding the whole thing in place. Through an unbroken blackout curtain to charred crimson tablets treading hibiscus tea. Or at least what the server told us was hibiscus tea. Lonely crybaby learning to crawl wawa. Then Lauren, who, due to Parkinson's walks with a walker and plays sitting down, finishes by standing on his own for Mark. I'm just gonna read one more poem. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to Wolsack and Wynn, Noel, Paul Vermeersch. It's a real pleasure to uh, see all of my fellow uh, Wolsack and Wynn poets here. I'm sorry I can't see you in person. I hope to one day meet you all. Um, this is called Dog Park. Like I've said before, I'm no Thoreau. But these dry dogwoods gesturing at a darkening sky appear to be signaling something unknowable only for me. So while in this park, please show me which plants are edible, which plants lethal. An electrical storm erratically flashing noiseless no-nos and no one else on these grassland notices. I remember one walker in this dog park calling that a bugbear. In this dog park beside tracks, burnt by dog paws and drought. Us owners speculated on a train's freight. The foo toted along and looking like tortoiseshell bread knives in aquatic dinosaur box. Blah, blah, blah. Then Coco bit Luna and two adults stopped talking to each, each other regarding the communal garden. Later that Sunday, my infant son, knee deep in his first neurological leap, insists on napping lung to lung. His ear pressed against my sternum, listening to terrified carbon dioxide flee my body. I understand his coups are signaling something unknowable only for me. Sincere gobbledygook, I try to reciprocate. Now I appreciate that an escalator refusing to operate is insisting it's an imperial staircase. And an interview is a kind of intimacy that must fail in order to be near real. Thank you very much, everyone. Please buy a book if you can tonight. If not mine, just anyone's. <laughs>
Thank you very much, James Lindsay. His new book is uh, Double Self Portrait. And if you pay attention to the uh, webinar chat, you're gonna see the information there on how to buy a book. And uh, we've got a discount on all our books tonight. And uh, I think right now would be a good time to uh, acknowledge some of the people who are working be behind the scenes uh, to make tonight and these books work. At the beginning of our program tonight, uh, you met our publisher, Noelle Allen. And Noelle uh, is certainly uh, the captain of this ship and steers us true, but she doesn't steer this ship alone. I want to acknowledge Ashley Hisson, our managing editor. None of these books would get to the printer on time without Ashley. I want to acknowledge our production coordinator, Jen Rollinson, who is uh, our de facto director tonight, making sure that everything technically is running smoothly uh, and has been doing wonderful work for us. And I'd like to acknowledge our intern, Brianna Wodebeck, who comes to us from the creative writing and publishing program at Sheridan College. She's the one reminding you to buy books in the chat and has been doing all kinds of work for us behind the scenes. So thank you to Noelle, Ashley, Jen, and Brianna for making tonight run smoothly and for making these books the success that they are. Uh, and we have one final uh, author uh, to bring you tonight and it brings me joy to introduce Rasikra Revolva to our audience uh, this evening. Rasikra is a poet a visual artist, a multimedia artist, performance artist. She is one half of the uh, excellent musical duo, The Data Bats. Uh, I'm a big fan. And her new book is Cephalopography 2.0. And um, uh, what can I tell you about this book? Yeah, only that it is as eclectic and brilliant as she is. Um, within these pages, you'll find lots to do with cephalopods, uh, octopi, squids. You, you will find lyric poems, you will find prose poems, visual poems, games. You will find a, a host of creative diversions and things to get lost in. Uh, I, I love this book very much, but I'd like to tell you uh, what Gary Barwin said about this book. Gary said, Cephalopography 2.0 is as much a passionate celebration of cephalopods in all their plurality and finery as it is a collection of poems exploring the human identity and experience through the lens of these marine animals. These experiments with traditional poetic forms such as gazelles, tankas, and cinquains, as well as more contemporary forms, make poems that are uh, uniquely <clears throat> make poems that are uniquely and beautifully composed. He goes on to say, strange and marvelous as the deep sea, full of beauty, fear, myth, play, multiple hearts and legs. These are poems of invention, creativity, self, sex, and surprise, which celebrate the marvelous glitch that is life, what it is to be alive, to communicate. Here, our tongue is a tentacle, alert to the weird and sensual beauty of language, to the alien and ourselves as we navigate the vibrant dark that is our home. Um, here tonight to present poetry from the book with some musical accompaniment, I understand, is the one and only Rasikra Revolva. Hello, everyone, and thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, everybody at Woolsack, and uh, particularly my editor, Kinesia Lubrin, and my designer, Kilby Smith-McGregor, um, both of whom put unbelievably monumental work into this book, and I'm completely thrilled. I am, as you now know, Rasikra Revolva, and I will soon be the Databats. You can find out a whole bunch about us online, and uh, I'll leave it at that. I, I believe in you. You can, I know you can do it. I'm going to read three poems for you, and then we're going to play a song which interpolates and adapts one of the poems in the collection. If you have it, please feel free to read along. I'll try to remember to say the page numbers, but I might get excited and forget. We are starting on page 17 with Octopo and Tuthiet. Tuthiet. 
Two October Tuesdays, Deltron Squid collided in the Pacific depths at sunset in July. Each one mirrored the other with a shimmering, voluptuous, sperm-plastered mantle and engorged arms bursting with come-hither barbs. The squid fell deeply in love, but soon they found themselves unable to feed. Both deladrons were inevitably drawn to hunting the other, now possessing the only flesh each craved in all the ocean. They pledge a vow of starvation, lest they risk consuming each other. With every passing wave, their bodies grew less sumptuous, their love more incandescent. And one November morning, both flesh and love were gone. Manifest Destiny. Kaleidoscopic headshots, 86 meters below the bruising violet, moonless black, flames hard yellow, by cuspid world, moist, severe, with prismatic tissue puckering into coarse beige purple, the flamboyant cuttlefish takes her first steps. A travesty of locomotion, a bobbing, poisonous punchline, strangle its wavering horror, weaponize its dead, toxic flesh. It's only natural. As drumless javelin slice on the water's surface, LED bell, sea foam light, brick red, fins displayed and arms displayed, the Japanese flying squid holds his first breath. A tragic waste of jet propulsion, a star spangled mockery on display. Vivisect the abominations, militarize their Icarian arrogance. My love, it's only natural. Breeding grounds, the stairway. Infallible, submerged in substrate, sedentary, sessile, subdued, suffocated, safe. World fingertips embedded, corrosive touch, coercive love, grit. Particles, wholeness, ground, earth, floor, sand, frayed tissue seeped between grains, light sluiced under a closet door, click of dried saliva, dusty pneumo rasp. How many walls can line a pit? Is it more or fewer than four? Shudder, seek a crevice to suck clean, suck dry, to spew frothing filament force field, wet muscle to knacker to rock. Interstitial, intertidal, caressed by the waves, abraded by the light, lighted by the waves, abraded by the caress, waved by the abrasion, caressed by the light. 
caught. Ripening reek of mammalian secretion, piquant lick of brine, flushing, soaking, gelid tubes and chainsaw tongues exposure, brazing, glowing, beak, eye, sphincter, cilia, hook, exposure, the swirling roar of synthesis, milk and rainbow, spitting fire from a silken core, Seizing light most ardently, resting free, resting free. And now it's time for some music.
hosts and publishers and once again I hope you all enjoyed I had a great time with all of your readings and I can't wait to read your books I hope everyone else joins me thank you Rasikra so that was Rasikra Revolva reading from Cephalopography 2.0 her new book <clears throat> and uh, towards the end of her reading that was the data bats Rasikra Revolva together with Wurtika on the keyboards thank you very much for the data bats to uh, bring a song to us tonight that song by the way is bodies from the data bats 2018 album of water and it is a uh, an adaptation of Rasikra Revolva's poem uh, breeding grounds fallacies from cephalopography 2.0 uh, so let's hear it for the Secret Revolva and the databacks. Yes, and I see lots of clapping down here in the webinar chat. And I'd like to thank all of our readers tonight, starting with Ross Belote. So please let him know uh, that you appreciated his work tonight. James Lindsay and Lauren Turner were with us tonight too. All four poets did a great job. And I would remiss if I did not remind you that all four of the books that we launched this evening uh, if you purchase them uh, from the Woolsack and Wynn web store at woolsackandwynn.ca are 30% off until Friday, October 2nd. So get in there, uh, take advantage of this amazing offer. If you buy all four books, you'll save $22. And I'm sure that our, uh, our intern, Brianna, will be throwing that information up in the chat again before we are gone. Um, can I remind uh, Jen to perhaps uh, save uh, the, uh, the chat information so that we can send it to our authors this evening? And I'd like to thank, finally, you, the audience, for being here with us tonight. 
Uh, we so appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to join us, whether it's in person, uh, in a live venue, or here in the Global Village, uh, online in cyberspace. Uh, thank you for being here. It's kind of like being in Tron. Uh, here we are inside the CPU sharing this electronic wonder. And that's it for us tonight. Uh, thank you to the audience. Thank you to Woolsack and Wynn. And thank you most of all to our four talented poets tonight. Their books are for sale, 30% off, woolsackandwynn.ca. I've been Paul Vermeersch. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening and enjoy the rest of your week.